The Security Weekly News is live on Tuesdays and Fridays at 12 o'clock Eastern Time, most every week. I try to scan and produce a quick look at some major stories to help you keep up with what's going on in and around the industry in a short format. Myself, Jason Wood, and other guest commentators provide greater insight every week. I'm Doug White, and I hope that you will look for the Security Weekly News in all of your favorite podcast catchers and subscribe for the latest content. I love that guy. But hey, uh, speaking of loving that guy, uh, why don't you come join us on our Discord channel to do chat with our hosts, ask questions, customize live stream alert, and more. Come visit us at securityweekly.com forward slash Discord to receive an invite. We're all there right now. Some of us are paying more attention to the show than others, but uh, I know there's some serial Discorders in here, but uh, the conversation just keeps on going after the show is over. But welcome back. It is time for the security news, and we are joined by a new guest, co-host, Mr. Lee Neely. Well, good to be here. It's a nice cheer. I, I'm looking out the window because it's getting dark, late, light, later, later and later. It's, it's <laughs> crazy. Uh, and good to see you guys. It's been a while. It Too has. Long. It has, Lee. It has. Yeah, it was uh, it was uh, it was funny. I was just commenting the same thing. I walked out of the studio to use the uh, the restroom and grab another beer, and I'm like, man, I usually don't leave this room until it's dark out. It's still it's still light out. It's still light out. Yeah. All right. So, what do you want to start with? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Sam, do you have to leave a little early today? No, I don't. Not today. Ooh. And I'd like to hear about this SHA-1 attack. I don't really understand it. <laughs> so my story number two, uh, SHA-1 yeah. is a shambles. Yeah. Um, uh, I won't profess to understand all the math behind this, but I had some uh, some really uh, good questions uh, to some other stuff here. Um the the long and the short of this is that right in the the front of the page here um a group of researchers have been able to um uh find a chosen prefix collision for sha1 uh which effectively means a complete and practical break of sha1 hash function uh according to them but but practical seems to mean two, complexity of 2 to the 61 and a cost of $100,000 that's not what I would call all that practical. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, goodly. I was going to say. I mean, if you consider that Moore's law is broken, then yes, it may not be practical. Yeah. But with uh, quantum computing coming around the corner to speed that kind of cryptanalysis uh, computation up, it may become practical. So uh, we Lee. shall see. But yeah, Lee. But we, it's been it's been like at least eight years that we've been saying get the hell off of SHA one collisions are a problem. It right, had nothing true. to do with the time it took. It was it was practical to do them. This just made it ten times more practical to do it. Um, and yeah. the hundred thousand dollars, I bet you can do it for less. Um, I mean, we're supposed to be just bagging SHA one. For we should have all off, been off of SHA one actually by now. Yep. Well, apparently a lot of things aren't. They have a list of things that are still using it. Yep. Uh, I, I'm shocked, Sam. Shocked. GNU PG, uh, CA cert, open SSL, yeah. open SSH, DNS sec. Uh, yeah. DNS sec is pretty gruesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, so my question was, uh, when I heard about this, uh, was I posted uh, to some of my friends in the wireless space uh, because uh, SHA-1 is used with uh, WPA, uh, sorry, WPA and WPA2 pre-shared key uh, for driving the PMK. So you do pre-shared key, 2096-4096 oh. two, uh, uh, iterations of HMAC SHA-1. And my question was, oh. well, if SHA-1 has a problem, does HMAC SHA-1 have a problem? And the answer was no, no. No, no. I'm like, damn it, like, because that could have been a whole lot of fun when we started talking about wireless authentication and having some of those those breaks there. Yeah, actually, collisions don't matter as much as people think they matter. I mean, if you put an MD5 hash on an image for integrity, that's still perfectly fine. Because even a chosen prefix attack doesn't mean you can create something that will match a particular MD5. That's the thing. I mean, this is a theoretical flaw, but the hash functions really don't lose all that 
all their value as quickly as people think they do. Hmm. So, so Sam, to that, uh, one of the, the most amazing uh, implementations of the MD5 um, hash collision stuff that, that I have ever seen personally uh, was by my good friend Tom Liston. And uh, Tom Liston, for a little while pre-pandemic, uh, and I think it was the first year of the pandemic, he hosted his own little invite-only security con for just a bunch of his friends called Liston Con. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, and the one that he did um, the the last time. Lee, did you go to the, the last list and con like COVID list and con? No, I was doing stuff online with it, but I wasn't physically there. Right, right. I don't think anybody was physically there, um, just because it was I, COVID. Right. Um, but he put together a game in which you had to find out a bunch of trivia and do some programming and find some uh, uh, answers and that type of stuff, and then you yeah. check boxes in a PDF. So you'd physically change the contents of the PDF. Yep. And the PDF contained enough Java so that it would regenerate itself upon those answers to uh, have a, an MD5 collision. Right. And, and, and the punchline? I don't remember the punchline. Right, but that means that... The changed the PDF, yeah. even with all the changes... The MD5 hash did not change. Yep. Anytime you made changes all the way through, the MD5 yep. hash did not change. Yeah. Yeah, Which but that's a, chosen, was freaking cool. that's a chosen prefix attack. I Correct. mean, you can do that, but you can't make something that will match an MD5 of an arbitrary file. No, no, no. Right. But the the whole idea is that, um, you know, that's possible to have, you know, with an MD5 collision, it means that it's, it's you know, not guaranteed unique to represent one entity. It's It, it can be impersonated. I realize there's a lot of details, as you point out, but I'm just saying that's a, that's a, that to me is a, 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 an alert or a heads up or whatever. That's, you know, we got to start moving to something else off of this. It's yeah. not the end of the world, but it's time to start that migration. Yep. Right. All right. Yep, and so, it's freaking cool, by the way. <clears throat> yep, and, and and you know, uh, Sam, it was interesting. You said practical, right? Uh, yeah. And they said that uh, their practical implementation was uh, on a quote academic budget, uh, in which they rented GPUs, nine hundred uh, Nvidia ten sixty GPUs, uh, and cost them a hundred k to uh, to break this. <clears throat> but later on in in their uh, report. Um, they noted that um, the the entire chosen prefix collision cost about 75k. Um, it was not optimal, however, and they lost some time. And uh, computing prices went down. They estimate it could run about forty five thousand dollars. And as computing costs go down, um, they evaluate it should cost less than ten thousand uh, dollars by twenty twenty five. Okay, well... I mean, 10K in 2025 is not... When did they do this? Um, like, physically, when did they buy their GPUs? It doesn't specifically say. And they rented the GPUs. I'm wondering if this was during the... When the GPUs were, like, five times MSRP, and now they're not? Yeah, I mean, yeah. they did rent them from um, from a company listed in the article, uh, GPU Servers Rental. So... I'm, I mean, I'm wondering if they if they rented them because they you know you couldn't find them for love or money at a certain time. I mean, absolutely. I mean, they said they used 900 of them. So, I mean, <laughs> but, at the time, 900 for 100k was probably a pretty good bargain. And they used them for two months. So, yeah. But they did note that the classical collision for SHA one can now be done for about 11k. Yeah. I, the the pre chosen is much more uh, dramatic and much more has much stronger implications, but it's still that was the one they discovered back in 2017. Right, was the classical. Yeah, that's pretty affordable. Yep. Yep. I mean, not not necessarily affordable by me, but no, uh, well, uh, yeah, affordable by a uh, a reasonable attacker, and I'm not even saying determined or nation state funded because a reasonable attacker will easily spend. 10 grand probably even 100 grand for for something like this depending on the outcome so what's this what's this actually going to mess with then is this going to mess with digital signatures and stuff like that no yeah. can it break yep. tls no where, where are we going with this what what what's actually going to be affected 
It's a great, great question, Aaron. Um, so they're, um, it, <laughs> they're, they're saying, uh, you know, what is affected? Uh, and they really only had two sort of examples here. Uh, PGP keys could be forged if third parties generate SHA-1 key certifications and X509 certificates could be broken if some CAs issue SHA-1 certificates with predictable serial numbers. So it's it's still pretty narrow. Um, you've got to have some pretty interesting use cases there um, and some very sort of, the stars have to and the planets need to align to sort of make some of this happen. Right. But if I could generate an X509 certificate with a uh, that where the SHA-1 collided with a legitimate one, then mine would be passed off as legitimate. Yep, that could be bad. So, so the, in that that signature, that digital signature, or whatever, would no longer be valid. So, that's that's the you know the tinfoil hat version, right? Yep. Yeah. So it, it, it's, you know, Aaron, it, it's a great question. It's like one of those, oh my God, the sky is falling. But is it really? Well, it, it, it is falling, but it's just going to take a really long time to land on us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I think but, maybe at this point, um, probably the NSA is going to be able to do some cool stuff with this, but us mere mortals have a few years to wait. What I've noticed is that you get certificates with not just SHA-1 signatures, they've got SHA-256 and 512 signatures as well. Yeah. The question I have is how many things are still validating the SHA-1 certificate? And then, in other words, can they can they validate the other two? Mm, yeah. Yep. Certain, yeah. Certainly, yeah, I think about that and like, oh, I'm going to use a CA certificate X509 in my browser, and I'd argue that it would have to only be signed by that one because we'll probably do multiple validations for all of the, the, the various options that are pre potentially presented by a certificate that has multiple. So, yeah. So, did you want to talk about Dragos? Uh, of course. Before we do that, Lee, real, real quick, the, uh, sure, uh, I sure. love the, the what should I do on this particular article. You know, remove oh, the use of oh. SHA-1. All right. Uh, and instead use SHA-256. And then one you don't ever really hear about all that often, SHA-3. <laughs> what happened to SHA-3? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I think that I get the, you know, use something other than SHA-1. And, you know, everybody always hears SHA-256 yeah, SHA and not SHA-3. Like, I just thought that was kind of interesting. They did call, call out all the possible good options, which included SHA-3. All right, uh, Sam. Did you have the uh, the Dragos one as well? Nope, just you. All right, so uh, Lee, let's do it. So Jeez. this one I saw a couple of days ago that they basically uh, ran into a compromise of the new a new employee personal account because their onboarding process got basically compromised. And you know, this is one where Dragos is just like saying, "Hey, we did it wrong." And here's what you should look for, which I thought was just really cool. I mean, that takes some serious cojones to say, well, hey, we screwed up publicly. And, yeah. yeah. Especially uh, a, a company in the security industry in uh, arguably industrial control SCADA, you know, security as a, as a focus. I, I think there, to me, this is... Uh, I, I included this article not because holy crap they got hacked and bad on them no it was holy crap they got hacked bad on them but they don't negotiate with ransomware folks and nope. they went and said you know you know up yours we'll we'll take our losses we'll take our lumps and then they went public about it on their own quickly up front and explained exactly what happened yeah so yeah, uh, yeah. i, I mean, want i want to try and get this level of detail about you of your average disclosure for the hack all right Go right yep. ahead there. Yeah, so uh, that was my story number one. Uh, but today, uh, so yeah, I'd heard about this a couple of days ago, but today I found uh, my story number 12, which was uh, deconstruct deconstructing a cybersecurity event. And this is the post on the 10th by Dragos. 
this is ah, yeah. them saying, hey, this is what happened. We have a culture of transparency. We had an extortion scheme. Here's the timeline. Here's exactly what we did. And here's everything. Here's everything. Screw yeah. you guys. I'm taking my ball and going home. Yep. This is this is an incredible amount of great detail. They mapped um, it to the miter attack. <laughs> we, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, very nice. Yeah, like they even made you know contacts to a bunch of other folks in Dragos and like commented about their families like rude like you're already in and you're not getting payments so now you're going to try to extort me by doing other uh other bad stuff about other people in the company because you finally got in you figured out where you were and then you did some OSINT and even still it doesn't work yep yeah is there any attribution coming out on this? Do we know who the um, filthy hackers are? Uh, let's see here. Well, they got the IP addresses, but of course that doesn't really tell you. Yeah, sure, yeah. of course. No, I don't think uh, a known cyber criminal group uh, attempted and failed an extortion scheme. They didn't say, I don't think, which which one it was. Which will be interesting. Okay, it will be interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure it will come out at one point that uh, that they do, you know, uh, given that transparency. I mean, I know a number of folks that are there, and I wouldn't be surprised if that at some point they do uh, that they do talk about it. They're they're not shy about you know providing attribution for all of some of the other stuff that they discover. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it comes out at some point. Sam, yeah. oh, sorry, Lee, you got a comment in there? No, I was just reading through the text. It's like, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm sure that the the non-verbal response, I mean, or the verbal or non-text response to those because they weren't responding had to be freaking hilarious. <laughs> um, I can think of how I would have responded before type touching a keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> well, I might need you to come over and sit on me to make sure I don't. Yep. <laughs> Yep, that's it. But I was also thinking. Wait, wait. Did we just get invited to sit on Lee? You did. I think you did. Oh. In the event of an attack like this where I was going to respond inappropriately, and I need help. Lee, with you're my... always inappropriate. We'll just ask Shell. Okay, there you go. <laughs> That'll be more fun and more successful. But, I mean, they have nice recommendations, and I'm thinking, you know, with on with, with onboarding, there are some windows where it's it's susceptible, particularly with some of like the multi-factor onboarding where it just needs a single factor to get started. Um, but I'm wondering how many of us have holes in our armor that could be driven through at the if, if the timing was right. right. Yeah. It's kind of a race condition, I should say that. Yep. yep. Right. Hey, um, can I go back an article or two? Sure. Sure. Paul's so not here. We can do whatever. Just, Paul's just not here. We can do whatever we want. For how much it costs to rent these things now? Yeah. Uh, a 4x 3090, so that's four 3090 GPUs. Yep. With mm -hmm. 142 gigs of system RAM and 18 CPU cores, costs a dollar sixteen an hour on RunPod right now. Oh. Gee. So renting all oh. of those GPUs now would be, and this is because of large language models, and 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 Lambda functions that are that are going crazy right now. So r renting a hundred thousand dollars, it's probably down to like ten thousand right now. Interesting. Yeah. Right. Hey, Sam, Steph, I'm sorry, for a class I'm going project? backwards, but I got interested well, I in seeing what it would cost now. No, that was it. I, I was looking to see. Yeah, but we don't have any ten thousand bucks either. Cost. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but maybe we should talk about these AIs. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, Aaron, like, Aaron, you're up for picking the next story. I'm putting you on notice. So. Uh, Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll f go for Sam and these darn AIs. Like, what are we gonna do yep. about it? Well, you know, I remember last time, last week, I think we had this big argument about AI, and I was the guy saying, "No, the AI doesn't understand what it's doing at all. It's just throwing around words like an actress reciting lines in a language it doesn't know." And this, a Scientific American article says, I am wrong. Huh. What it says is they taught an AI to play a board game, Othello. They had some other tests too, but this is the easiest one to understand. 
And um, the, the technical test here of whether an AI, see, the question is, do AIs actually have a representation of the world? Because if you think about a baby, you, you look at the world, you see dots and then noises come and then things happen. And eventually, after enough experience, you decide there's really a world out there. And, I, and it's, you have a representation of the world in your mind. And the thought was that AIs did not do that, and apparently they do do that. The large language model playing Othello, they sent a probe in to see the state of the neurons, and they found a representation of the Othello board in the neurons. And they were even able to switch one of the squares from black to white in those neurons, and that would change the move it made accordingly. Huh. So it does... Whoa generalize from experience and make an internal representation. So this is very close to what we would call consciousness. In fact, this is something humans don't do until around age two. I've been told from people that know more about child development from me than this, that infants at a certain age do not have object constancy. If you show them a ball and then you put the ball behind the couch, it's gone. Yep. And it object only permanence. comes later when yep. they realize, no, it's still there. And if I move over here, I'll see it. Even though I can't see it, I know it's there. And that is this intellectual accomplishment of having an internal representation of the world. So you actually understand that there is a world out there. I'm not just mapping stimulus to response like a reflex operation. Huh. Yeah. So they say the, uh, the people that did this say we are not that far from AGI, artificial general intelligence, which is, you know, when yeah. AIs really are thinking like humans to some extent. That's Skynet. Well, no, it's a step in that direction. Singularity. Yeah, it's and, and although, very be, cool. Well, to be fair, I mean, there's another article near the end that claims the opposite. Um, <laughs> now, my article 18 <laughs> is, they, the question is, do they have emergent properties? And what they say, an emergent property of a system is you make the system bigger and bigger and bigger, and then at a certain point, something appears that was never there before. And so they right. tried making language models bigger and bigger to see if something changes. And they said, in fact, there are not emergent properties because you just think there are because you're using sloppy measurements huh. that appear to make an abrupt change out of what was a smooth transition. So, you know, mm -hmm. I think I think what we're hitting here is the same thing as all along. It's very difficult to define human intelligence and human consciousness. Right. And AIs have some of it, but not all of it. And we don't really quite know how to measure it and quite know how to say, but anyway, it's a whole lot further along than anybody expected, I think, except Kurtzweil. Kurtzweil predicted all this 30 years ago. Yeah, you were, you mentioned that in the last show, and that kind of, that, that quote blew my mind, and I had to share that with some folks at work. Like, he saw it coming, he, he based his life on it, and he appears to have been right. He said, around this time, there's going to be a huge exponential increase when the AI suddenly gets really smart and changes everything, and I think that's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah, it, the I, I saw something uh, this morning on the news, and I, I I was you know all over the place, and I had an eight o'clock meeting, so I didn't get to actually see it, but I just saw, saw the little blurb that uh, what was it? The founder of uh, Chat GPT was before some government group saying you need to put some regulation around this. Like the guy that created it is saying we need to pull well, this back a little bit. Well, yes, but that I think is not a representation of real danger. That is the standard cynical thing. The company that is established said, okay, now you make rules so the small guys can't get in. Uh, this is like Facebook says, oh, make rules over social media because, of course, we could comply with the rules, but that'll freeze out the competition. Good point. Good point. And, of course, but, they probably didn't pick that up on the news story either, but it was. Well, that's what no. the podcast I listened to said immediately, but I listened to cynical tech podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. So says the man with the robot with the brain the size of a planet behind him. That's right. Right. That's the idea. Mar I, I just think it's neat that they're finding things that are, you know, that it's, 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 it's going beyond what they hard-coded into it, as it were. That it's, 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 it, I don't, wouldn't call it growth. That's not the right term, but it's, well, it's, it's more than the sum of the parts. I mean, would it would it That's not be neat. would it not be considered growth? Because if you think about uh, yeah. Sam's analogy to object permanence with a two year old, yeah. that two year old grows into that object permanently, like grows those neurons to be able to make that happen. And if we have AI models that now have quote object permanence with that Othello board, yes, it's grown. 
Yeah, it's, I'm, I, I caveat the term growth because of the language in the article that basically is warning against in, evaluating the wrong attributes to determine this behavior or to measure it. And I, I but I, I would have called it growth. Um, but it's, you know, it's your creation is doing more than you designed into it. That's yes. awesome. I mean, somebody, somebody should really be very proud of that, that work or the teams, some bodies, because yep. it's cool. Yeah. And, you know, I think I'm still not as scared of AI as the people that know a whole lot more than me. I think that, um, the first thing it's going to do is give us all kinds of useful tools, and then eventually there'll be some downside. But I really don't think it's the Terminator in the end of the world. Of course, if that happens, no. then I'll be sorry. Yeah. Well, so I you, always you ask, got, please, and say thank you. Right. <laughs> well, you you got to understand what you know what what its impact is on what you're doing versus what you would have done before, and whether that's a good in the right direction. As long as you have the ability to back it off. And we, you know, we, what do we say? It's like running in non-blocking mode, right? You're learning, you're figuring out what it does before you, 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 you know, enable the weapons. Yep. Um, well, it's it's already going to be driving cars, and probably mm -hmm. before long it'll be in fighter jets and stuff. So, you know, there will be some of this uh, giving it too much power. Uh huh. Uh huh. Some. Some. We yeah. already have robots armed with lethal weapons. Uh, San Francisco, I think, put out the rule or the law that they're allowed to arm uh, robots with lethal weapons. Um, I don't know if you've watched Boston Dynamics' latest videos, but it's, wow, impressive. Tesla's uh, latest videos are pretty scary. Tesla robots. The Tesla robot. I haven't yeah. seen that one, but I saw that it was out. But yeah. are, are they using, um, by chance, Asimov's uh, laws of robotics? <laughs> no. Oh, Nobody figured out how to do nope. that yet. I got asked that parts. on the radio the other day, and the answer is that in Asimov's universe, uh, what was it, uh, United Robotics? Yeah, uh -huh. USR. Yeah, uh, USR. Whatever it was. Uh, USR. USR was the single source for positronic brains. Yeah. So they imbued those brains with those laws. However, here in the U.S., or in this world, and in this timeline, uh, we have multiple sources for all of these AIs. And the more rules you put around the AI... The more companies leave your country and go to the U.S., where we have no rules about AI. Interesting. So, yeah. it's uh, China has AI regs. Uh, the EU has an AI reg, or actually an open source reg, that says that even if you're writing an open source AI, you still have to follow all the data protection, all the everything. Yep. And um, so all those companies are leaving there and coming to the U.S., where we ain't got squat for regulation. Uh, because they're they're able to do it fast and loose and get their code out the door faster and make money faster because the almighty dollar. And I don't think we're going to have any regulation. I mean, they were appearing before Congress, and I think just like all these tech things, it's too early. If they were to write a rule now, they wouldn't even understand what to write, I think. That's Although point, Europe yeah. supposedly passed rules for AI. Well, I don't really uh, understand. Well, the FTC has requested that AI not be used for clickbait, uh, to, to, to turn social media into a, a army of human robots clicking whatever you want. Um, too late. And, sorry? Too late. Yeah, a little too late, no, no joke. Late. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the EU has that open has that AI Act. China has massive amounts of, of AI regulations. All those companies are leaving those countries and coming here because, uh, thank you, Gauss. America! We ain't got no rigs. America. This is America. I like it here. <clears throat> yeah. So, moving along, Aaron, did you find a story you liked over there, buddy? Um, I, I don't know what stories you've got listed for this week, but I was looking earlier that um, Twitter had finally ruled out encrypted direct messages, obviously starting with verified users because it's all about the cash. But I'm just wondering what you guys think. No, um, <laughs> did, did Twitter need encrypted DMs? Um, where, where on an attack chain am I vulnerable when I'm um, DM, slipping into someone's DMs? And um, <laughs> where am I vulnerable for somebody to see how I'm doing that? Uh, so, Aaron, I think you're maybe a special case about slipping into DMs, but that's a different story altogether. Um, oh. I, I don't... Personally, I think about Twitter starting to do encrypted dms is probably a little bit too late like they're trying to play catch up with you know stuff like signal and whatsapp and all these other uh encrypted message options so 
And the crypto oh. experts say they did it wrong. Their stuff is not really encrypted the way it should be. I wouldn't hand my data to Elon Musk. He's already leaked DMs when he gets mad at people. I mean. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Well, if they're encrypted, yeah, then he couldn't, he's, he's right? Pr he's pretty naughty. Yeah. Did you see the other day that it was a big thing over in the media over here that um, Elon Musk had gone to see the Prince, French president Macron and um, he was boasting to Macron that he'd been out on the night before and got very drunk and was a bit hungover on shaven and had to sleep in his car before he went to see Macron. What? So he, he's getting more Bond villainy every day. <laughs> I didn't hear that one. Oh my goodness, oh. Josh. But yeah. So um, DMs <laughs> encryption. Um, did we need it? Does anybody care about Twitter anymore? Probably. Or, um, is it only us um, Gen X and Boomers? It's all blue oh, sky. God. Are you telling me that Facebook is not for like the the cool people anymore? Uh, it, it's where I follow Larry and Shell leading around the world, to be honest. That's probably my favorite thing <laughs> on Facebook. Nice. So, I mean, yeah. I, I honestly think that uh, if you want to talk social media, uh, which is terrifying me, but uh, Facebook is becoming a necropolis as of, I think, 2050, somebody said. Um, and uh, Twitter is just causing more chaos and, and spam and, and bullshit every fucking day. Excuse my language. And it's all right, Josh. Um, we had Kevin on earlier, so you're you're good. Mother, that's, fuck. Just, what, that's just what I was thinking as well. So amazing. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, and like, what's next? And I'm I, I'm Let's actually go. honestly asking that on 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 Discord. Somebody tell me what's next. What it's do I need question. to switch to? I mean, uh, TikTok. Okay, great, cool. But I mean, what else? What else is next in terms of social media? I don't know. I'm honestly curious. I, I, maybe we haven't seen the next big thing yet. I have a 10 year old daughter and they just talk about um, Snapchat and Instagram now. So um, I don't know if there's any other names I've never heard of and I've not picked up from her. But she wants to talk to her friends on Snapchat rather than WhatsApp. Even. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, our, you know, our house, the nine year old has asked for uh, messenger kids. Because a bunch of other her friends are on Messenger Kids, and she's like the is last Facebook to hold up. Messenger Kids? Yeah, it's Facebook Messenger Kids. Okay. <clears throat> um, I think it's funny that Facebook Messenger is probably going to outlive Facebook. Could be, but uh, yeah, we we hear uh, Instagram. Um, we don't hear a lot of Snapchat in our house. It came up recently with our fifteen-year-old, and uh, they have very much listened to their father, and said. You know, Dad, sometimes you have to ask forgiveness, then permission. And they said, I installed Snapchat, and uh, I added a couple of my friends because a couple of my friends have it. And I said, now you can delete it. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for telling me, and thank you for being honest. And they came out and literally said, you know, you know you've always said sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. And I didn't ask permission. I'm asking for forgiveness. Can I keep it? And I said, no. You've got TikTok. You've got all these other ones. The the reputation behind Snapchat that we have seen. Yeah. How about no? Which was kind of good because a couple of... Are you of... telling me you'd allow TikTok on your home network but not Snapchat? Yep. I mean, and it's cool because I have a TikTok account and I do videos. Yep. And but, uh, uh... Josh, it looks like your video has frozen to us. But uh, in any case, we can hear you yeah. just fine. Um the uh, and the irony is of that you know ask forgiveness instead of permission um a couple of weeks afterwards um they came to me and says hey dad you know how you said i couldn't date until i was 18. yeah well here i am asking for forgiveness instead of permission and i'm like aha now i know why you wanted snapchat uh-huh <laughs> made the right oh. decision made the right decision not the same thing <clears throat> yeah no so, Josh, I'm going to put you on the hook for a story if uh, you've got one. Otherwise, I'll give you a minute to, to find one. Take your pick. You want a minute or you want a story? Give me a minute. Okay. I, I've got a couple things I can talk about. I mean, if we want to keep talking about AI, I'd love to talk about AI. All right. Yeah, uh, it's not so it. much a story. I just did a I did a webinar on AI for INS, the Institute of Applied Network Security. Yep. You might know him. And um, Kevin's a, a faculty, faculty member yep. there, as am I. 
and uh, there were 2,600 people that signed up to watch the webinar. Wow. That's how popular a topic it is right now. Huh. Okay. Yeah, it's huge. It was, and, and by the way, and the, the, normally on a webinar, you get like a 60 to 80% attrition rate. People that don't show up, but they, they sign up, but they don't show up, especially a free webinar, right? Um, I had 1,650 people on the webinar, roughly. Wow. So I had about wow. a 40% attrition rate, which is, I, I know it doesn't sound like much, but it's, it's indicative of how important a topic this is, yep. right? Yeah. And I, the questions that came in were fascinating. Fascinating. Yep. Um, how do I block this? You don't. Uh, how do I, uh, how do I use it effectively? Lots of ways, yeah. you know, but, but what's the specific use case you want to talk about? And so I've got lots of people signing up for, for sessions to talk about their use case. Um, I had a lot of people go, is this going to, you know, start the missiles and judgment day and Skynet? And I'm like, you know, not yet, maybe in a few years, you know, talk to Sam. <laughs> Apparently Sam knows when it's going to happen. I don't know. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, but it was, it was fascinating how, uh, like, the same day, I literally got called the same day by a radio station going, hey, would you come on and talk to us about, about AI? I'm like, yeah, sure, okay, no problem. And um, it was, uh, it, it's absolutely crazy. I, I, I realize there's plenty of stories on the page, I apologize. Okay. There is sort of a self-inflicted story, if you will, from the webinar. But I was blown away by how many CISOs and CEOs are absolutely terrified of huh. what AI is going to do to their business models, what it's going to do to their people, what it's going to do to uh, how they do business in general, hmm. and their they supply chain and everything else. And also, by the way, the biggest thing, I, I'm going to give you one takeaway. How many of the third parties that you share data with, that you let them process your data or you get data from or whatever, do you have in the contract that you don't allow them to put your restricted data, your confidential data into the AI prompt? Right. And the answer is, of course, zero. Because right. nobody thought about this when they wrote this Well, contract. I mean, depending. I mean, I, I think about from a, you know, we, when I had been at InGuardians, um, if we were, say, uh, getting ChatGPT to write a pen test report for us, there is absolutely no way we could put customer data into a prompt to write a finding for us because we're under non-disclosure agreement and we can't disclose any of that data with a third party. Right. Okay, except that... Uh, Office 365 Copilot, which is in private beta right now, it's going to be released in the next few weeks, Yep, states that your data is your data will stay in your enclave. So if you have a, um, if you have a commercial account with them and you put the, the pen test results into Microsoft Word Copilot, mm -hmm. okay, or PowerPoint Copilot, we all know how you like to do reports, Larry. I do. Uh, you could have it do that because your data will not be put into the general public or general tenant, mm -hmm. multi-tenant training data, whatever you want to call it. So it's, you know, do you trust that? I, I don't know. No, knowing what I know about certain companies, the answer is no, you don't trust that because despite on whether or not it is your, your enclave, it's still a third party. I, and, yeah, I and, 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 I'm, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that that's, that's quote the reality. No, I think you need to run your own LLM on your own server. Yep. That's the only way to be sure. Yep. Agreed. And actually, since Meta got leaked their Llama LLM, which is one yep. of the most efficient LLMs out there, you can run it on a Pixel 6. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I run them on free Google Colabs, and nice. it works. But those aren't the latest ones. Those are older ones. Nice. Well, so, so Meta is actually using... So this leak was one of the best things that could have ever happened to them. They're crowdsourcing improvements to their AI. They're actually uh, uh, rolling in the things that people are doing to their AI in the in the in the world in the wild, and using it as a, as as a crowdsourcing of improvements. It's amazingly cool and horrifying all at the same time. So the latest version of Llama, the Meta AI, is actually the one that's open sourced. Speaking of Google, sorry, Sam, your your story number three. Okay, the zip TLD oh, yeah. sucks and it needs to be immediately revoked. Yeah, I oh actually would appreciate some uh, some help on this one because that <laughs> Google is now selling uh, the top level domains zip and mov, uh, and therefore you yeah. can make a URL like evil.com, uh, and you can make it so that it looks like a file name, but it's really a domain name. And 
at first I wasn't sure I saw why this is so bad. And I've seen some people put up web pages where you click on something. It looks like you're going to download a file, but you really go to a website. So there is a confusion there. Oh. But anyway, I'd be interested in what you guys think. How dangerous is this really? <sighs> this is going to be terrifying, I, I personally think. it's if, if you've got any kind of domain filtering for malicious domains in line, you're fine. But if you're just relying on... No way. I mean, the article has three examples at the top that look like something completely like they're not. And think about how we've taught users to hover over a link to make sure what they're getting. I mean, well, this sure. looks freaking it, legit, right? Well, I know, literally I have the, the like the song from the producers, like Springtime for Hitler, running through my head. This is this is so horrible. Well, it's, 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 it's incredibly, incredibly cool for pen testers because yeah. as a pen tester, uh, like Larry, 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 I mean, as a pen tester, uh -huh. can you do things with this? Uh -huh. are, are, but but if you find yourself doing this, ooh, uh -huh. I can do bad things with these. Uh -huh. Okay, that's bad. Uh -huh. Okay, well, I, and we need I to get rid like of them. To see, I'd like to see research because I think if you send out a link to a hundred people. Somebody will just click on it no matter how fishy it looks. And even if it was a little bit convoluted like this, I think you're only going to target a narrow band of intelligence where people are smart enough to look at these details, but not smart enough to realize they've been fooled by the extension. I question mm. how much real threat this is. But anyway. I mean, I think it adds a heck of a lot more credence to a, some of the stuff that we were probably already doing. Like I think about, I, I registered four .zip domain names, and I'm looking through my account right now to see which ones they are because I've already forgotten. Because that's the problem, kind of problem I have. Because uh, there's 110 domain names listed currently, <clears throat> uh, but the first one is firmware.zip. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. The but if you think you're downloading <laughs> firmware and instead you go to a website, how exactly is that a huge security risk? Well, then what do we deliver via the website? Do we actually prompt them automatically what's, for yeah, a download of firmware.zip that is something malicious? What's what's the yeah? What's the default payload from that website? Exactly. I would think downloading something is a bigger risk than visiting a website. Oh, I would agree. I would agree. So you you click on firmware.zip, you think you're going to get firmware.zip. You get redirected to a domain called firmware.zip where I give you firmware.zip of my content. And, well, how is, and, so where's the added risk? So potentially some of the added risk is that, uh, you know, now maybe we have some applications that uh, are not properly um, setting their URLs. Like, I don't know how many times I've gone to a web page for some mom and pop type of stuff that I've clicked on a link and it's been improperly formatted instead of you know instead of going to website.com forward slash downloads forward slash firmware.zip it's just been firmware.zip and then you know it gets redirected my to my website so forth and, and and so on so i can see that there's going to be some potential you know drive-bys as they as they were of some of these but i i think my biggest one is adding to the social engineering that we're already doing like firmware.zip the next one i got was uh, mac os update.zip Mm -hmm. uh, there's two and more in here uh, bear with me I have to scroll because they're not alphabetized uh, the the one that I got was fun is raffle.zip rolling on the floor laughing uh, .zip and the mm -hmm. other one was uh, Josh will appreciate this one sbomb.zip yeah, fuck <laughs> just fuck yeah <laughs> Please download the software bill of materials so you can be secure that in your supply chain. Here's your malware pre-served up. Oh. Yeah, again, all to, to a lot of that social engineering, you know, misconfiguration, uh, some of those types of things. But uh, well, well, you know, while we're on it, we ought to talk about uh, Microsoft looking inside zip files. Yes. For malware. Yes. Zip files, like yeah, but they, can they look inside my zip domains? No. Um, they, Password protected zip files. Password protected yeah, was, zip files. Yep. Yeah, I don't know which. I don't know where the article is in our list, but I know oh, it's. Yeah, okay. it's, you're number four. Yep, my number Larry's four. Number four. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And, and so this was one of the the tricks that we used to do, uh, and and so forth was, if you wanted to get a payload via email into uh, an organization, you, you just password protect it. 
and they can't then, open it to scan the contents inside. So, of course, then what folks started to do was just, if it's a password-protected zip file, you block it. Right. Yeah, but there's good right. application for password-protected zip, like because you can encrypt a, uh, a file with, uh, with zip and a password. Um, right. So that you could potentially do secure, you know, secure transfer of data you know, in a non-complex method for an average right. user and so forth. Well, you can AES encrypt a zip file, yep. which makes it pretty damn secure. And I'm thinking, how are they? I was going to, I was trying to digest what were the, what were they doing with the password protected to analyze it because it's likely they're, they're trying they're trying common passwords and they're trying passwords in the email they say. Mm. Oh, okay. So if you if you zip up malware and use infected, it won't be able to go on Microsoft Cloud anymore. It'll get caught. But right. there's another thing which I just learned from this article. Apparently, everybody else knew this since 2005. The Microsoft password protected zip files are not secure. They don't use AES. They use some proprietary thing with 332-bit keys, and it is vulnerable to an exposure attack. If you can guess eight bytes of the plain text, you can recover the key. Yep. And this has been known since 2005. It's bloody awesome. <laughs> yes, it is. It w uh, you know, Sam, I can remember using this, I don't know how many times, to recover data out of a zip file around the 2005-2006 time frame because there was a whole bunch of tools that came out that was like, oh, you forgot the password to your zip file? Great, we can just shortcut that for you. Especially since <sighs> you can see the names of the files without decrypting it, yep. and therefore you can guess those eight bytes because you can get the headers and footers of those files. Yep. Yeah, so it, it, you got to really AES encrypt. Then it would be fine. But the Microsoft zip thing doesn't do that by default, which I guess because they inherited it from the MS-DOS PK zip, which didn't do it that way. Ah, gotta love it. Gotta love history. Gotta love history. Those, yep. wait, I was going to say, those who don't learn from history are destined to repeat it, but that is not actually the correct quote. But it is close. It's close enough. It's close enough. Yep. You're good. Yeah, but this is, this is just because you're using really old stuff. I remember... Um, I went to a conference one time and they were talking about why, uh, and they brought up something, why Microsoft passwords are hashed with MD4. And the reason is because they did it, they designed this in 1993 and MD5 had not been written yet. The most advanced oh. hash function that existed at the time was MD4. Mm -hmm. And they just never upgraded it. Oof. Oh. I apologize. I've been really bad looking at Slack while we've been on the show. So, but uh, yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, I noticed that Lee has three stories now because I did a refresh. Yeah. Lee, go four. go go for one. Pick one. So, um, I actually thought of you with my number two story, Larry. With a I mean, Mustang Panda. Leave, leave it to me. Leave it to you to think about me about number two. Well, the PP Link <laughs> routers with with for sale. <laughs> Yeah, well, here we go back in the crapper. Yeah, right, um, right in the shitter oil. Yeah, there you go. Um, but the, you know, exploiting the TP Link router for persistent attack. I mean, there's a, there's a ton of TP Link out of there because they're so freaking cheap. Yep. Um, and uh, and notoriously just, insecure. Like I said, though here, and isn't that already a Chinese product? Um, Ooh. But. but it, it it's kind of cool what they're doing, you know. They're 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 adding some shells here, and they're 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 going to stick around so they can come back later and, and mess with you, unless you probably do the old factory reset. But uh, that was just I just thought, whoa, this is kind of cool. Um, and I'm they're of course targeting residential and home networks, which to me that kind of targeting is they're more looking like the Mirai model than you know trying to get trying to get at Larry's, you know, Mary's family to get the kids to reinstall Snapchat. <laughs> Mac, um, Mac OS update does it. Sorry, Sam, yeah. go ahead. But how did they get you to put corrupted firmware on your device? They say they haven't figured that out, I guess. Yeah, that's a great question. Social engineering? Firmware.zip. That's right. <laughs> it right? does seem to be that. Right? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I, I spent, I spent some time and I, and I put this on some of my socials, uh, late last week, um, 
into some of the wretched hive and scum of scum and villainy of the internet uh, last week. Uh, specifically, I was looking to uh, put together a model for uh, doing some supply chain stuff. Uh, irony that I work for a company that does supply chain stuff around the automotive industry. And for us to do a demo for something like that, it all has to be stuff that is, quote, available in the public domain of some variety. Uh, because unless we had permission from one of our automotive customers to take their firmware and to put it in a publicly demo that could be identified and so forth, can't do it. So we've got to go to the internet and just find stuff that's out there. And that's what I was doing last week, was going to the internet and finding stuff that was out there. But holy crap, there is a lot of stuff out there. And that's where that article last week came from about uh, hacking the Volkswagen mm -hmm. automatic steering. Because we found that, you know, there are a bunch of folks in the tuner communities and so forth that pull these model, mo the modules, the ECU and the BCUs and all that stuff and dump the firmware so that you have a backup of your, your original. So if you start to modify this, you can put it back to factory. Uh, yeah, and some of those places were not... In, some of those things that I were, were finding were not in great places. I mean, if you want to get the... Uh, the What the attack vector thinking was, get to go to the Checkpoint article that's linked in my other article. They basically found routers with weaker default passwords and... Oh, uh, and upgraded them for them. Yes. And I guess, and oh. they forgot, not only they didn't get a good password but they also forgot to turn off the internet mo uh, management option too yeah. interesting interesting oh you know yeah. lee, lee thank you for this this is a great model i've got some some research coming up and this is like a, an amazing case study uh for for some of that yeah. type of stuff I, I mean it's 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 really neat what it does and uh but tim i've i'm thinking how many people are are smart enough to actually change the you know is it is it a big deal that people still do the defaults or is it becoming a littler deal? I mean, I know originally nobody did it, but I mean, I'm trying, I'm and it's just not that long ago. Um, and I say this, that I've just picked up a new, uh, uh, five, uh, sorry, six giga gig enhanced Wi-Fi router. And I set that up a couple months ago and I want to say it was TP link. No, it was D link. Um, mm -hmm. that I can't remember what they asked for when I logged into it the first time, whether I want to say that it had a default password, yeah. but it asked me to change it on the first login. Yes. That's good. I, you know, Larry, off topic, but yeah. I've got a question for you. Yeah. How many wireless routers do you have running on any given time at your house? I mean, I'm no zero chaos. So, <laughs> um, currently I have, let me do the mental count for... Five, six, seven. Uh, I think I'm close to nine currently mm. running <laughs> at the house. Just, just like, and we're not talking like ubiquity where you have them all, you know, hooked up to a single system. We're like, these oh, yeah. are different ones for testing. Yeah, yeah. nine. Mm -hmm. Nine. Nice. The, 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 the ubiquity is a mesh, so it covers the property. But so, yeah, the, if you if you really wanted to do that, that's thirteen. Um, so no, I mean, I have, I have just a couple of those running and they managed to cover my property. I've even got a wireless bridge over to this garage that I'm in right now, uh, mm -hmm. using a couple of nano stations and, um, you know, works great. Yep. Yeah. So there's, there's um, nine in yeah. all sorts of various, uh, configurations. Uh, and then if you expand that to some of the, the non-traditional, um, Wi-Fi access points, like you think about other access to a network, uh, there's, uh, two lower gateways, um, and maybe a couple of other fun little things as well. And a zig nice. and a z wave. <laughs> Good boy, exactly. Dude. Exactly. Bingo. Yep. <laughs> So, exactly. I mean, I'm thinking probably would have killed Larry when a couple months ago I was going through the closet and pulled out all this old APs and stuff that I hadn't run for a while, and I, and I, and I literally threw them away. Oh, no. It's, you, I have to do the same thing. And that was supposed to be my project this winter. You know, all those nice cold days where it's snowing out on a weekend. We'll get out of the basement, and we'll just clear out a bunch of stuff. And guess what? New England didn't get those nice, cold, snowy weekend or weekdays, for that matter. So I have piles of stuff that needs to be, quote, filed and put away in all the appropriate locations. 
but I can't because they're already full because the old stuff needs to come out before the new stuff can go in and it just didn't happen. How many WRT 54 G's do you have living in drawers and boxes and uh, none in dra- backs of closets? <laughs> none in drawers, backs of closets. They are actually all together. Uh, we gave four of them away as a raffle, um, you know, maybe a year ago. Uh, I think I probably still have. Ooh, goodness. Well, I had so I had my collection from we when we wrote the book, and then Paul was right. going to toss his, so I grabbed all of his. So I probably still have thirty of them left. Oh my god. Yep. And we need. Okay, who wants to do a raffle for WRT fifty four Gs signed by Larry Pesci? Well, that's what we did. That's so that's how we gave the last four of them away. No, no, you've got 30 of them. (laughs) Let's get rid of some more. And also, we have other routers that were tangential that were also potentially hackable for open work. Like, I have an old-school BT Home Hub. I should send it to Aaron. Yeah, you really (laughs) It was the the BT Home Hub where I think that had the Dext phone built in. And, yeah, it was it's fun, fun stuff. So yeah, and then we've got the, the the La Fonera devices, which were the precursor to what the the Wi-Fi pineapple hardware was, and yeah, I just need to I need to send some of this stuff to the electronics recycler. It's it's time. Oh, one of the cool things that our local uh, electronics recycler will do is they will actually do a DoD wipe on media if you ask them to, mm. and it doesn't come with a cost. It's, they'll just do it. Nice. We have we have a big dumpster. I, I can do we have it better a... than DoD <laughs> with a twelve gauge. So you know, yeah. whatever you need. Yeah, we have a dumpster. Well, you throw stuff in. <laughs> so with with that service, I can give I can give a, a computer and its drives to my wife, and she can make sure the right thing is done, and I don't have to wipe it anymore. Nice. As much fun as it be, I'll take it out to the shooting range. There's, you know, it's a yep. little faster this way. Yeah, with your wife, you just need to put flies on it so you can get the flies at the same time. Right? That's 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 absolutely <clears throat> it. If I wanted to make a target that she could hit every time. <laughs> yep, yep. Aaron, you're looking bored over really there, buddy. Shot. No, I'm good. I'm just listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, Come on, man. Speak up. Speak up. It, it's okay. It's quarter past one in the morning here. It's exactly. actually Thursday, so um, I'm a day ahead. Exactly. So uh, uh, give me give me some stock tips, like what's hot. Like you're if you're day ahead. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> oh, I tell you what is hot. Nothing to do with stock tips, but the um, new Michael Jordan film Air or something like that. Just mm-hmm. um, completely going off on a tangent. Look that up. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh goodness, goodness. All right. Uh, who who wants to go next? Well, I'd like to get some opinions about my story fourteen. So the Department of Defense is no longer going to use third-party endpoint protection on their WinPoint machine because they say it'll be good enough to just use Microsoft Defender and just have 100% Microsoft software all the way through. And they think that monoculture will make them more secure. So I wonder what you people think of that, probably closer to the military than me. Huh. I think Aaron's probably the only one closer to the military, but maybe not. Well, it depends on the military, right? And then, well, I mean, you know, Lee, maybe some tangents. I mean, there. I was seriously looking at a new uh, spec for Windows that had qualified the use of the Defender pro- this Defender Suite, the paid Defender Suite, uh-huh. as the endpoint protection suite, you know, because it's a it's a decent suite. But I'm well. It's the old integrate best of breed versus go to one source. I mean, that's a lot of eggs in their ba- in one basket. Although they've been doing a good job. Um, but what? But, but it just makes me nervous. But Lee, you threw two terms out there. What happens when best of breed is single source? Uh, oh. Monopoly. <laughs> exactly. Was, yeah, change. monopolistic. Although, you know. One of the interesting things is that years ago, a vendor told me that, you know, because we, we, you come you come to me as a government agency, you want these special features to meet your specifications, and I'll spend, you know, $100,000 to get these things in there, and I'll make 90000 in sales, or I could just sell the next version of the product on the open market for $100 million. Hmm. Why would I do this? Um DOD is a bit bigger than a hundred thousand. I understand, but sure. still, they're generally big enough to get special stuff from a vendor. So 
Yep. Cause, I mean, and it's. I would argue that it's they're they're a little bit bigger to get special stuff from a vendor, not just because, hey, we have product A and we want it to do B and C, but I think the the intent there is that once we're in, we start to have the ability to have a lot more trust, and then can sell them product X, Y, and Z, and on top of that, to integrate with product A, because they asked for B and C. Yeah, I'm thinking this would be good for a supply chain point of view. Sticking just with Microsoft rather than adding another vendor in there. Yeah. And it's also not bad from an IT perspective because you're not relying on your staff to do the integration. I mean, you know, Defender's already built into Windows 11. It's yep. all yeah. there. I mean, but yeah. you, you start thinking about this and you, you you roll back to history a little bit. Internet Explorer was also built into Windows. And yeah, that how'd that go? How'd that go? Um... <laughs> Gee, what's that in the background? Is that Bruce Springsteen behind you? What? Where? Who? Where? where? <laughs> yeah, as he changes the subject. Yes, I, I, yeah, I get it. There's, there's, there's always a, a dark side. Totally. Um, but like, if I were sitting here, where I can't get enough IT staff to do what I need, this would, this would buy me some resources back. Um, and yeah, I'm throwing money at the problem because I'm having to license the Defender Active, whatever the hell it's called, right? The ATP or its current name. Which is not bad stuff, it's, and there's no negative in that. I'm just saying it's trade-off, it's, it's risks. Um, and if I'm, like I said, but there's so much shortage, I'm wondering how the military is doing on being short-staffed. That could be a hell of an argument. Just sure. not enough hands. Yep. And, and yeah, and, you know, I don't know, Aaron, whether you were leaning forward because you wanted to say something or... <laughs> um, no, it, no, it's okay. It's like uh, me and Jason yesterday on the news were sort of talking about um, military cyber and how they've been discussing recently about um, whether they want to lift cyber out of the army or in the sort of different verticals that it's in and actually make a cyber force. Coming from the British military myself and being in communications on cyber, no, anything that you can add extra people to is is going to be great. And um, if you're only having to teach them on Windows Defender, um, it's it's going to free up some extra people to maybe do something of a bit more maturity. But yeah, I I I, I think defense definitely hasn't got enough people in cyber currently. Well, I was in class last week. One of my classmates was somebody from the Army CyberCon. Holy crap, he was good. <laughs> um, and he, he, I, I get the impression that that he was pretty much standard for his for his business in terms of his abilities. Hmm. So that's cool, right? <laughs> I mean, dang. But I said, and oh, by the way, we could also get go down the um, the path of. You know, don't most of the vulnerabilities show up in Microsoft products? Is that because they're there, or is that because everybody's looking there? Right? Yeah. Is that a path to insanity? Maybe. Yeah. And didn't China come up with their own desktop operating system, not Microsoft Windows? It was Linux-based, yeah. They said they're oh, going are, Is that not North Korea? Or was oh, no, it that's, that's right. Well. That was North, North Korea. North Korea was North Red Korea? Star. No, North Korea made Red Star, but some other country recently said they're going to make their own too. Was it China? I'm not sure. Well, maybe they didn't yeah. learn from North Korea then. I think one of us should Google that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead and Google it. I was just thinking it was an Asian country, and China would have had to be big enough in terms of resources to pull it off. I don't mean to discount mm. Korea. Not not, uh, not only would they have the resources, they've got the potential install base to to go deploy yeah. it to. Yeah. So. But uh, I don't know. I don't think I don't think I'd go about writing my own OS in these these this day and age anymore. Um, yeah, you don't really need to. I mean, especially since what uh, one of the hacking groups leaked the Linux source code online. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. Anyway, it's a cool article. It's 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 not a surprise, but damn. Um, so, all right. What else we got? So, do we confirm you? What now? Did Sam get his confirmation? Oh yeah. Well, I'm interested. No, I just was interested to hear the discussion. Those are all good points. 
All right. Hey, uh, what else? What? Uh, what? What? What else we got? See, I'm not a hog like Paul. I want to give everybody else equal airtime, including Aaron over there, yeah. Lee. <laughs> yeah. Well, my number one is almost a TLDR. Basically, they're saying that the ransomware developers are are, are encrypting so fast that they're destroying the data on on the web. They're doing a bad job of it, so you're never getting your data back. But that just kind of cements the don't pay the ransom. It probably won't work argument, yep. which they, more and more people are doing. They're just rebuilding the system. They're not paying. A few are, but far fewer than a year ago or yeah. a couple years ago. They encrypt at excessive speed. That seems kind of funny. I um, saw an article which, that said that uh, even people who pay the ransom, often it takes longer to recover than the people who don't mm -hmm. pay the ransom. Huh. But I wonder if that just means the people that pay the ransom have a more incompetent staff. Mm. Mm. Or are understaffed. Right. That's it, it yeah. It's it's how many hands have you got? I mean, you read the the big ones. They say not only bring in investigation, they're they're hiring, you know, everybody who they can get their hands on to uh, help rebuild. Uh, even saw some email threads along that line recently that there were just a uh, general shout out. Anybody got people that can help us rebuild? Um, yeah, yeah. So, one of my ex-students called me with that issue, trying to hire people to rebuild fast after ransomware. Uh, do you know how many times I've been called? Holy crap, we got whacked. We have backups, but they're semi-broken. <laughs> blah 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 blah. Yep. You know, like like. Jesus, it happens. I, I I get calls like that every week or two at least. Yeah, I, oh, and Josh, add to that, we got we got smacked, we got ransomware. We want to know who did it. Oh, oh and, and like the the but the we always go back or we were always going back and it's like, well, what are you gonna do about it? Like, yeah, I mean, who cares who did it? Are you gonna sue him? Are you gonna take him to yeah. court? Like, why are you gonna spend this money? How about we help you figure out how this doesn't happen again? Yeah, that might be, that be a little better use of your money. Yeah. 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 Uh, I went to a high tech and in, uh, crime investigators meeting with the secret service, you know, who sit on and they brought up just this issue and people all had that answer. And the police said, Hey, you know, some of us actually do care who did it. <laughs> oh, well, if you're in law enforcement, yeah. Yeah. But that's it. You know, and and by the way, there's an ever increasing number of stories about law enforcement, particularly with international cooperation, that's resulting in in takedowns, uh, which uh, are, are are helping move the bar a little bit. I know some of those guys they they scatter like like uh, insects and then reform somewhere else. But uh, what was it recently? There was a group of, I want to say it was forty in Spain that were brought down because they were they were basically hosting. Uh, DDoS service nodes, and so they hmm. took that. They've arrested the folks as well as taken their nodes. Okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna push back a little bit. I'm I'm gonna point out that you're right. There's more and more takedowns happening, and that's cool. Don't get me wrong, that's cool. No, no, no. But the problem is, is that the thresholds for the police, the law, and local law enforcement, and nothing against them. I was local law enforcement. You may no, no. give a crap. You may go, oh man, that sucks. I'm really sorry. This is horrible. But at the end of the day. You don't have the resources to do anything about it, and mm. your, your 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 lieutenant or whatever is going to go. No, turn that over. That's not what we do. We're not a cyber unit. Okay, yep. well, so who right. do I turn it over to? Turn it over to the FBI. You call the FBI. They're like, did a hundred thousand dollars or more change hands? No. no. Then we don't give a fuck. Call IC three, the Internet Crime Commission Council or something like that. Right, I forget right, right. Sorry. Um, they'll take a report. They'll add it to their statistics, and that's all that will happen. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so Lee, I'm not I'm not saying you're wrong. You're right. A lot more takedowns no, no. are happening. Yeah. But you just but you the, just apply to reality check, which is cool. There's so much there's going on. There that. are so many I mean this is uh, what was what one of your stories? Who, whose story was it? Uh crap. Uh t story twelve from Sam. It's literally about this kind of thing. Catfishing on okay, industrial it's not, scale. It's it's not ransomware, but it's like Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was uh, very it's, it's, interesting. It's about yeah, Sam. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, it's because I've I've always heard that if you go on one of these dating sites, all the women are just fake, and uh, apparently now the details have come out that they hire people. They tell you you're going to get a job as a tech support agent, 
And what you discover is your job is to pretend to be a woman on a dating site, and you have to talk to each person for only two minutes and then switch to a different persona, and you have a, a persona handed to you. You're this person from this country with these interests and these children and stuff, and they carefully designed them, and uh, they keep a log of what to tell the person. So when it gets handed off to a different representative next time they call in, they will be able to carry on the conversation. Wow. And people spend a ton of money doing this, and then they send gifts, and you know, you trick them to invest money and rip them off. And it really is sort of horrible and cynical. But uh, it's interesting to hear from the other side what these jobs are. They talked about how a guy got hired, and he, he didn't know what the job was, but when he found out what it was, he still needed the money until he found someone he knew, one of his friends in his own town, was the guy at the other end. <sighs> and he said, well, uh, I asked if they could pass it on to another agent, and they said, no, keep working. So I just kept working oh. and continued to fool him. Oh. But, you know, it's... Um, Look, and by the way, let's be clear. This goes back to our AI stories from earlier. As soon as they get AI, the AI worked up with the scripts and the language models for this type of issue, romance mm -hmm. scams, uh, business email compromise scams, um, I, I got to go through the fucking roof. Uh, the Spanish prisoner scam. You know the Spanish prisoner scam? No. No. Oh, oh, this is awesome. I get to do history now. Okay. Remember your thing about if those who do not remember their history are doomed to repeat it? Sure. Guess what? It's true. So, uh, AI is watching all of social media and says, this person has gone to Spain, okay? And it's uh, the, the, the grand, granddaughter of, of this other person, right, grandma. And so they pick up three different movies that that kid made in Instagram. Kid, they're in their 20s, whatever, but I'm old, fuck it. And they use that voice to deep fake the voice to call grandma and go, grandma, grandma, I'm in Spanish prison. Please send $500 to this address. And I'll be bailed out because of the money you sent. Thank you, Grandma. I love yeah, you, yeah, Grandma. Yeah. Bye. Click. Mm. That's a deep fake. Yep. Grandma frantically sends five hundred dollars. You know, goes down to Western Union. Yeah. Oh my God! Dear. Buys the gift cards, whatever the fuck, and sends the money. Right. Yep. So that's the Spanish prisoner scam. That person is still on the beach in Spain. Yep. But when AI is able to scan all of social media and find every grandkid in Spain and Italy and mm. Croatia and wherever <clears throat> and call grandma with a deep fake and make them send 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, 800 bucks, whatever, guess how much money they're going to make when they can industrial scale it without any human intervention, yep. so, without needing to hire any of these people. So, so Josh, I'm going to... By gonna... the way... Go ahead. By the way. The, the reason that this is history is the Spanish prisoner scam goes back to the Crusades. Not a joke. Oh, jeez. In the but Crusades, you know, they were right. They they would literally walk out to the to the Crusaders, and be like, "Hey, you know." And, and this is the people selling them their their, their their the peddlers selling food and whatever. They'd make notes of names and make notes of relationships. They just chat because they talk, and then they'd write letters that night. Dear mother, I am s held prisoner in a Spanish prison. Please send a thousand pounds to this address. Not a joke. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So to, it literally dates back to the fucking Crusades. So to to blow your mind a little bit, Josh, and uh, I stumbled upon this, um, you know, just humor based, and, and I was uh, I was on uh, YouTube looking at some of my normal stuff, and you know, in the next suggested videos, things that came up, um, like I thought we're we're back to AI again. I thought about I saw this video and thought about that like holy crap, this is an amazing creative way to use AI <clears throat> and it was arguably one of the first um, applications of using AI to do some fun stuff and and this particular fun stuff was taking um, uh, AI generated images of Harry Potter characters as high fashion models wearing uh, Balenciaga uh, inspired outfits and then using their voices from the contents of the movie to have them say phrases that the artist wanted them to say, and then having AI animate the mouths based on that audio. <clears throat> now, it's not terribly sophisticated. The voice work is pretty good. The AI generated images are amazing the animation of those images for quote the whole deep fake stuff is rudimentary at best have you seen the republic Ru 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 republicans 
No, but it's probably very similar. But the the point that I'm getting here is that after they did a couple of these things, the next video was a tutorial about how they did it. And do you know how much it cost them to do this convincingly uh, Harry Potter Balenciaga advertisement? Nothing. Nothing. The bucks. Nothing. Dollars. And honestly i think the worst part of all of it was the animation of the images um for the the video portion of the deepfake by the way i've thrown some of the images from the republican this is this is putting famous republicans in drag the one that i just threw in discord oh. is um let's see that's uh desantis on the left uh matt gets gates on the right and of course our favorite tucker carlson in the middle um, but I can put one more that is, uh, just drives me nuts how hilarious it is. Our, our, and that our, is, of course, our favorite friend, Mr. McConnell. Yep. And do you know what I spot immediately about every one of those images that's wrong? What's that? The lighting on the face is too bright compared to the rest of the image. Every single oh, that, one of dude, them. Dude, I'm not saying they're oh, great. Yeah. I'm that, just saying that these but, are really, really funny. But I bet that they're... For a certain segment of our audience, these are freaking hilarious. And how much did it cost them to make these? Nothing. Nothing. You, you can throw do, some, you you can throw do some deep money. fakes on an app on your phone. You, you throw these. You throw some money at this, and yeah, I feel for our, I, I fear for our next election cycle. I really do. Huh. <laughs> right. I our mean, next election cycle is going to be owned by bots. Yeah. Before we get too I, far, I'm actually eagerly awaiting a paper paper printed on letter press printing presses so that bots can't interfere with it at all. Those printing presses will be controlled by some sort of industrial IoT device. I guarantee it. <laughs> uh, moving along, um, I had a story that I wanted to grab in here. Um, uh -huh. My story number seven, which was kind of, yeah, it, it, it's kind of off the wall. Um, it says the cyber stalkers using new Windows feature to spy on iPhones. And this was kind of um, interesting to me. Specifically, one that I read this article and I started going through this, and uh, Microsoft announced that uh, their phone link app has been around for many years and it's designed to enable uh, users to connect their Android, excuse me, Android phone to their PC via Wi-Fi so that we could have similar types of things that we have with our iPhone and our Mac so that I can get my um, iMessage and all my text messages on the phone and I can, you know, do a handoff between like my web browsing session on one to the other and email and, and so forth. And I'm like, well, that's great. That's for Android. And we're largely an iPhone household. And they said they're going to expand it to allow iOS users to connect their iPhones to the PC in the same way. And I'm like, yes, my wife needs this because she has an iPhone and she has a Windows system. So now she can, I can text her a bunch of stuff that instead of having to view on this small screen, she can view on a much larger screen because she got this text message on her Windows laptop. Like, I sent her the trailer on YouTube to uh, Disney's Haunted Mansion movie that's coming out this summer. Right, the new one. Yeah, and like, I texted it to her, so she, now she has to look at it on this little screen. But if she had also gotten that text through something like Phone Link on her PC, on her, on her laptop, she could have viewed it on a nice screen with a little bit better audio and, and all of this type of stuff. And like, we need this in our house. Except, well, uh, <laughs> huh. There's apparently a bunch of um, issues uh, with this. Um, and I'm, I'm I'm failing to remember what the actual issues with oh uh, phone link on the PC can view sent and received iMessages send iMessages to contacts view call history make calls and view the contents of notifications. So now if we compromise a Windows system, we can do all sorts of other uh, fun stuff, right. including turn the camera and all sorts of other stuff. So. You get access to a Windows system that's paired to one of these phones. Now you can start using abu using and abusing the phones too. And therefore, you're breaking two-factor authentication that works by SMS. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Lee, you had a, did you have a comment in there? No, I, well, not really. I was I was looking at it thinking, okay, it's Bluetooth, but yeah, if, if you remotely compromise my system that I'm Bluetooth paired to, game over. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, the <laughs> it was this for me. The story was quite frustrating. It's like, holy shit, I need that. Mm, wait a minute, no, maybe I don't. Yeah. <laughs> Cause, yeah. Well, well, isn't the same thing true of the iPhone tied to your Mac, though? If somebody compromised your Mac, they'd also have your iPhone. So I'm not really sure this is a bigger no. risk. No. I mean, it, th this is true. No, uh, I think it's true of mine. When I get a text uh, message, it pops up on my Mac. Yep. Uh, oh, I mean, it can. I mean, can, and it, you could send but, it from my Mac. So. Yep. Right. But mine pops up on my Mac because I've linked them through iCloud and allowed the message to appear in both places. Correct. It has yeah. nothing to do which, with which where is, my phone is. It's, well, uh, it's, it's a back end. Well, sure, but, right. It doesn't mean it's not vulnerable, is, but it's different. Yep. Either way, sure, if you, but it does mean that yeah. your iPhone is effectively part of your Mac. And if yep. they compromise one, they've compromised the other. And, and I, I would agree. And, I, and Sam, I, I, I totally get where you're going with this um, in that, yeah, you compromise my Mac that and if you now have access to my mac and you have access to my iMessage, you can break that two-factor that does text messaging and potentially some of the other absolutely. stuff even email Not and so forth that. and you're absolutely right same thing for windows um but i am going to throw out there i'm on a mac but i'm so i'm an invincible um right. and, uh, I, and i know uh. that and then and i know that i'm not but if you tr look at the traditional attack surface is that you know mac os is less of that attack surface than windows is so that would yeah. that would be the only thing that would make me even more remotely more comfortable about it on my mac and then I, and i'm saying remotely more mm -hmm. comfortable about it so yes yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you i would actually be very unhappy to think that my iphone security had gone down to the level of windows <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay if you've got defender yeah, I know. The, that's, the pain that's of the what free version. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Paid, of course. Oh. No, but, um, no I, and, and it, yeah, that linking anything, I think, can give you a lowest common denominator risk scenario. You, you know, buyer beware, right? Um, yeah. Yep. yep. Aaron, what do you think? Putting you on the spot there, buddy. Uh -huh, just leave me alone. I'm okay. I'm just watching. <laughs> 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 I mean... Well, I, I don't. I, you, I mean, it is getting late there, so I mean, you got to be keeping yourself awake, awake with that shirt. I suppose it's the the day glow of that shirt. I didn't expect to take so much stick for my shirt this evening, but um, yeah, getting called a chav. Uh -huh. I, We're hey, doing well. We're doing well. Hey, I called you that off air, and that was just for me and you as a joke, because well, I know you're because <laughs> I know you're not. But you, you, you always have amazing, um, amazing couture, my friend. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But only when we're in really expensive bars in London. I mean, this, that's that's where you'd wear something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But th this this is just um, me wanting to feel happier about myself with color, right? So we have a break from black. Uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. And if you and if you can't like do something like that and be happy about yourself with it, then what's the point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's all good. It's all good. <coughs> Love you, man. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, oh, oh. I, okay, so let's uh, let's go take another story. Yes, Josh. Um, I was very sad I, I, to read Larry's numbers eleven. Oh, that's but a good one. What do you got? Oh, what do you got? Josh? No, that's a good one. Let's do it. Uh, yeah. Yep. Basically, what they did is a they bought about two hundred and what two hundred and eighty odd. Bones from an auction site. Two, two, uh, uh, last year, two hundred and twenty-eight from a police and, impound auction site. Yep, propertyroom.com. Right. Room <laughs> right. So, and they were they weren't wiped, so they were able to recover a lot of data. And what I was a little concerned is, and I don't know what the makeup in terms of what OS and or hardware platform they were, is that I thought pretty much all the smartphones, Android or iOS, had a uh, had a lot of protections unless you out and out had the passcode. Now, some of them had the passcode on yep. them written on the back and stuff. Um, but if you were to re attempt to reprovision it, it basically wipe it without the credentials of the person it's tied to, the kind of the low jack option. Yep. Yeah. So, so uh, Lee, what they found was they bought 228 phones from propertyroom.com. And propertyroom.com, uh, what happens is if you have, uh, quote, police evidence locker, they have some devices, they have stuff 
in police evidence and or they can't return the device to its rightful owner right what do they do with it well you could dispose of it or maybe you could sell it and you could get a couple extra bucks in into to to fund your police force so they can list it at propertyroom.com get a couple extra bucks for it so let's say um larry gets caught and prosecuted for um uh, uh, what is it? Um, uh, identity theft. And I did so mm-hmm. on my phone and I go to court and I get convicted and this stuff ends up in, you know, in, in the evidence locker and I can't, and we don't know who to return it to, or we can't return it to the owner. Like you can't return it to me in prison. Mm-hmm. So you sell it. And what they were doing was they'd sell these things on propertyroom.com and they were unwiped. You know, Fresh out of evidence to propertyroom.com. And mm-hmm. of those, 49 phones of the 228 that they purchased had no PIN or passcode whatsoever. No. Oh. 11 of them, they were able to guess uh, with, uh, f- top, with the top 40 most popular PIN or swipe patterns. And I think there was one more that they noted... Um, that they had the credentials. that they had uh, a sticky note attached to the device, including the pin that said "Gry keyed," otherwise known as "Gray keyed," which they used to brute force the pin, and then they wrote the pin on a sticky note and stuck it to the device. Do you know how many? I'm, I'm on propertyroom.com right now. Do you know how many phones are on there? Holy crap! Yeah, most of them. Most of them. So this came up. They got reported to it, and I, Josh, I went and looked at propertyroom.com today too. To see what they were, because you and I have this propensity for going to like government auction stuff. No, I don't. I don't buy lots of stuff at auction. I, 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 I swear, not at all. No, oh, no, I, yeah, I didn't say lot. anything about buying. I just said we go to the sites and we look at stuff. I didn't say I didn't accuse you of buying anything because I wouldn't tell your wife that at all. Um, no, no. <laughs> but uh, yeah, window they, shopping is not buying. They they apparently were notified and some of the stuff that I'm seeing on there is significantly better. Like, every one of the Windows phones is like, it's locked and can't be activated unless you have interaction from... But... Do they really? I don't know. Yeah. Jesus. The, uh... Some of the discussion here was along the lines of, like... Yeah, maybe it is tied, but if the pin is on the device or you can easily guess the pin or it doesn't have a pin, why do you need to reprovision it? And what states are these in? Have they put them in a state that they need to be reprovisioned? <clears throat> the point being There's here is... There's some crazy... Oh, my God, USB drives. Oh, look, police, I just found these on the ground. Um, let me... You, you should find the owner. Yeah, and then they'll go to unclaimed property, <clears throat> and then they'll go to here... You, you, oh my God, people will buy these fucking things. Jesus yep. Christ. So the crazy part was, is that they, the, these researchers bought 228 phones that were unwiped and had all sorts of crazy data on it. Uh, let's see. Um, 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 uh, photographs of government issued IDs. Um, three of these were on phones that apparently belonged to sex workers. They contain those Ooh. sex workers contained communications with their clients. One phone had full credit files for eight different people on it, uh, and this is where the the whole uh, revictimization comes in. Is that uh, clearly someone was caught for doing identity theft, had the stuff on their phone, went to court, got imprisoned for identity theft. This thing ends up in evidence locker, then gets sold with all of the evidence on it. And now I buy it, and I have everything I need to do identity theft again against this person. Well, I mean, I didn't do it the first time, but... Hey, Larry, they've got two airport extremes and an airport express on there for 16 bucks. <laughs> How old are those? Old. Exactly. <laughs> I don't need well, any more of that old shit. <laughs> need new stuff. Well, I guess there's no problem that they, they for sure maintain the evidence on those devices. This is true. They didn't wipe them. Yep. <laughs> That one that had the pin on the back that had been gray keyed, the message chain on that phone had 24 Experian and TransUnit credit histories. Uh, any yep. chance it had Tyler's Bitcoin wanting information? Oh, no, that might have been on <laughs> that. No, that was probably on one of the other ones. Uh, we informed them of our research in 2022 and they responded, they review, uh, and then they stopped selling them. Now it slowly came back. 
And after that, they made the researchers made sure they won every auction for phones. All of the ones that they got after the fact were indeed wiped, except there were four devices that had external SD card storage that weren't wiped. <sighs> Universally, sure. University of Maryland. There are so many phones on here, man. Oh, my God. Yeah. They, I mean, I went and looked at Property Room, and I... It seems shady, not because of what we just talked about, but I, I, I went and looked at the jewelry and the watches section and I, I'm throwing a rough number out of out there, um, seven eighths of the watches that were there by were listed by retailers. The other one really? eighth percent were in fact like seized property and, and that type of stuff. And some of the one eighth percent seemed kind of shady in that we had our certified gemologist look at this watch and it's I'm like what? Yeah, you go look at the Josh, go look at the watches and, and tell me no, the, I, the I'm just realizing the sellers this in the seller box, it's police and other clients, and then it's all these these retail companies' names. IT I tech now mobile, hot deals, GC pawn, electronics, N N uniques. Yep. Et cetera, et cetera. Yep. So there's a company called Real Great Deals. Jesus Christ. Yep. Well, interestingly about the the propertyroom.com, I was clicking on an, on a, on a fair number of the electronics, and they all have a caveat to the effect of all personal information has been removed. They've been wiped. Yeah. Well, through I, our internal process. As a result of this particular story. But Josh, if yeah. you want to buy a 2014 police interceptor, um, there's there, they're there. Yeah, just shy of 200,000 miles. Those police interceptors go forever. Yep. Need a bluesmobile? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, uh, no, but I'm right. looking at cars because mine is about dead. So, yep. so uh, who who picked that one? Because there was somebody else in com in competition for a story there. Oh, I picked this one. So, Josh, you had a story that you said... How about and then Lee? Uh, Lee well, it Lee was Sam's you. Sam story number eleven about flunking all the students. Oh Did we talk, yeah, we didn't okay. talk about, we didn't that, talk yet, about that. Yeah, that's a simple one. Uh, you got a it professor, is, but I love it because it's so yeah. awesome. Yeah, well, the guy texts us. This, every many teachers are freaking out because students might cheat using Chat GPT, and what this guy did was he took the. Students had to send in an essay, and they were about to graduate, and he flunked them all so they couldn't graduate because he would take their essay, and he would copy and paste it into ChatGPT and ask, did you write this? And huh. ChatGPT will say, yes, I wrote it, even if you pushed in something from Hamlet or anything, because that's exactly the kind of question that causes hallucinations. And he just assumed that ChatGPT had a memory and it knew everything it had written, which oh. is totally false. And flunked them based on this kind of evidence. Oh, let's be oh. clear. And I love this fact: the, the 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 instructor was a campus rodeo instructor who also teaches uh, agricultural classes. And yeah, so and definitely he, he understands AI very so well. Can understand why he might not understand AI. Yep. Yeah. Now, I did. I did see one of these where uh, there was a there was a a screen uh, a picture of a paper that a student had written. Uh, and the student submitted for an essay, you know, the subject of the essay to ChatGPT, and then blindly copied the and pasted the response into the report. And it was very much the beginning of the uh, copy and paste was as a as an AI large language model. Uh, I don't have direct access to the internet. Like it was that yeah. standard boilerplate. Like I can't get access to the internet to get information for you. But yeah. blah 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 blah, and included that boilerplate at the beginning of their essay. Like they, the student literally didn't no. read. No. Yeah. Well, I've read articles oh, that's, where that's that's just... for on, if you search for online reviews, a bunch of them have that text in them because <laughs> people are just copying and pasting. Love it. So I'm trying to figure out why they. He says. I gave the students an X in the course. What the hell? It's an F, isn't it? Yep. Or is F is F maybe it's like incomplete? Speech. Maybe it's inco incomplete. I, I yeah. I, I think our next couple of stories should also be Sam's. And I really I, I love. I didn't know about these Sam, by the way. Thank you. Story six and seven. They're the same thing, uh -huh. just yes. for different uh, yes, places. Yes, I'm glad. Those Can ones you talk I about the Sam? Do you mind? 
Yeah, that's, I thought these were very interesting. There's this thing called confidential computing. And Microsoft has a product and Amazon has a product. And you can see the personality of the company in how they think about using the product. So the idea is you have a trusted execution environment where you can right. do processing, but you the data is not exposed outside that environment. And what Microsoft said is you can use this to target ads. Suppose you have a bunch of personally identifiable information about the customer and you're not allowed to use that. But you put it in a trusted environment and out come like keywords to target the ads. And then you can say to your legal compliance, well, we didn't look at the personal data. It's data. Yeah, basically, these are black box environments where you yeah. put the data in and the instructions on what to do with the data. And then yeah. the answers come out, but you're not privy to, nor can you change the instructions. That's the idea. So, it's the same thing as a TPM. A TPM minute. does the same thing. Decrypt yeah. the hard it's drive. It's exactly correct. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah. but the thing is, I can I can build a clean room, and there's some of them are calling them clean rooms or Amazon yeah. confidential computing, whatever. And, yeah. and, and another company can build a clean room, and we can compare data, but yeah, we can't you know, see that's... each other's data because the only thing that comes out are the answers. So if exactly. I have uh, like let's Amazon assume we're thing. looking for smurfing, uh, which is the yeah. practice of going from pharmacy to pharmacy to pick up pseudoephedrine pills uh. to make meth. Yep. I can yeah. compare the data from 15 different pharmacies and see what names are common without be, without getting access to their 14 pharmacies' data. Yeah. Okay? But it's really just the same thing as an escrow agent. You have some in-between company that had all the data. So anyway, and that's what Amazon did. Amazon had an example like yours, where two companies want to compare data. For example, we always have this issue of sharing threat intelligence. There's been an issue, I've heard of it for 20 years. Companies would like to let everybody know what the logs are of that attack, but it contains PII, so they can't share the logs. Mm -hmm. And this is where an ISAC comes in. Where what? An ISAC. Information. Well, so yeah. this is where yeah. the ISAC yeah. should come in. Right. The yeah. problem is with threat intelligence and threat sharing is the ISAC and the government and every, oh, you should always share with us. We all know that they're black holes, that they never give us anything worthwhile <laughs> out the other fucking side. Uh -huh. Okay, let's be clear. And, and I, I, I hate saying it because Josh. I love these groups, but they're worthless. It's essentially just another form of uh, escrowing. But anyway, they're pushing products based on it, so there may be applications. So, so Sam, what was the? You mentioned that like it gives us a pretty good idea about you know the the motivation of the company. What was it? Microsoft oh, sure. said you can use it for advertising, right. and, and Amazon, Amazon said, said you could, could use, use it, for... it to to compare data between two companies to detect fraud or something. <laughs> huh? Telling exactly, exactly telling. Hey, here's yeah, a great yeah. use case for this. One of it, you know, fuck bitches make money. The other one is like, oh. Well, maybe we can detect that somebody's doing bad things. Like, <laughs> yep, that's it. <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, intercourse intercourse bitches acquire currency. That's the that's the meme, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you're keeping okay. this thing cleaned up. I need to I need to I need to point <laughs> out that that in Discord, Gauss actually has a story we should talk about because oh, it's really no. it's it's shadow IT based. Um. And the story is about, you know, we, I talked about smurfing for meth, right? To uh -huh. get pseudoephedrine for meth. He says, did you see the story about how it's sometimes easier to obtain meth and synthesize pseudoephedrine if you have a cold than to go to pseudoephedrine? <laughs> Jesus. You're, you've gone all the way around. Does, now, does meth help me cause a, cold, a cure a cold or to get better from a cold? No, no, but the pseudoephedrine will. It's a, a great decongestant, you right, know? Right, right. So... And, and pharmacies are closed. If you, if you need pseudoephedrine in the middle of the night, if you have a chemical background, it is easier to go get meth and synthesize your own pseudoephedrine <laughs> than it is to go buy it at the, at the store. Wait, wait. This is hilarious. I, I, I want to I want to clarify the words that you use. That say that sentence one more time. It's middle of the night. There's no pharmacy open, and you can get meth. It is. <laughs> You extract the it is easier, easier to synthesize pseudoephedrine from methamphetamine than it is to find a store in the middle of the night that will sell you pseudoephedrine. Good lord! <laughs> I mean, but is it cheaper? It's, it's actually pretty cheap because the price has dropped on on meth and the purity has increased. As long as you get decent decent quality meth, apparently it's relatively easy. So, so what you're saying from a from a prepper perspective, I shouldn't stock up on pseudoephedrine. I should stock up on math. 
I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> suggesting you should stock up on meth. Let's be clear. DEA oh. is going. Oh, really? 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 Let's make some notes yeah. on this asshole. But, <laughs> I'm already on a list. I'm not that list, but now I am. But uh, yeah, seriously, they're, they're, what, what list are we not on? We need to talk about which lists we're not on. Exactly. But, I, don't, I don't know how um, many lists I'm on to describe which lists I'm on or not. Right. Oh God. But I mean, like, it's it's hilarious. This is shadow IT. They made it so hard to get pseudoephedrine. Somebody actually figured out how easy it was to get meth and make pseudoephedrine. Automatic. It's shadow IT. Oh, good to Lord. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> this kills me. One, one, one story I want to you know, hit before we uh, we wrap it up for the night and, and so forth um, was a combination of my story eight and nine. Um, specifically... Um, eight is the higher level article, um, and uh, number nine is the technical details of from uh, Sternum. Uh, the friendly name buffer overflow vulnerability in the Wemo Smart Plug version two. Yeah. Effectively, what they found, the 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 TLDR of the story, they got access to the firmware by pulling the device apart, dumping the the SPI flash, and did some analysis of their uh, the binary that controls effectively the plug, uh, and found that. Uh, they were using string copy to copy values I I into memory. The thing being was that if they had a friendly name of the device, you, you throw your Wemo plug in, you try to configure it, and you give it a friendly name like Living Room. And I say this because I have a bunch of these at home, uh, and I use them fairly regularly. Uh, you give it a friendly name like Living Room. But if you try to give it a friendly name over 31 characters, your Ooh. app on your phone goes, no, it has to be shorter than whatever um uh yeah, please enter name 30 characters or less that only uses letters numbers spaces dashes dot or underscores no special well, not a lot of special characters it's uh, running open wrt it's, yeah but it's running open wrt but the application is a compiled binary from from belkin so sure. that's what they were <laughs> that's what they were doing is the the belkin stuff so uh first party software as it were um Turns out this app uses string copy and the length function for the 30 characters is enforced by the app. Yeah. But not the API. So you could change the name to something using the API to interact with the device with no username and password to set the friendly name something longer than 30 characters and they could effectively control EIP. Now, so that said... You can do it remotely? Yes. Yes, with the API with no authentication. Mm. Yeah, mm, mm. is right. Now, so you have to put these behind a firewall, I guess, is the only thing you can do. Yeah, and not make UPnP available to the internet, and also, yeah, so it's right. using UPnP and yeah, and, right. yeah, and don't set the names more than thirty characters. Well, you can set the name more than thirty characters, but it's when someone else goes to set the name more than thirty characters is the problem. Because <laughs> uh, then you could get yeah. access to the device. Now, the only thing that I would argue here is that they cheated a little bit. Is that once they had access to the device, they disabled ASLR. Oh. But, well. <laughs> like, this becomes chicken-egg problem, right? You need to hack the device to get access to it to have your back door. But once you've got your back door, you can turn off ASLR so your attack is more predictable. <laughs> But like, it's usually not too hard to get around ASLR. Yeah. You just have to find a module that doesn't move and do a trampoline attack. So yep. they said that would be a pretty small improvement in their attack, and I tend to believe that's true. Yep. Yep. So, uh, you know, ag agreed. Like, hey, we can do this via trampoline attack and, and, and so forth. So, but yep. we're just, we can do this. Let's not prove it. Let's just turn off ASLR and, like, get to the meat of the problem here. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was kind of neat. One, because I use these yeah. devices at home. Two, Belkin has said, "Yeah, we're not going to fix these problems." Well, why not, Belkin? Oh, what, because what they're is, they're due for end of life in the next month or so. Here, what's the value of these devices? They're inexpensive. They're about twenty bucks. Well, what do yeah. they do? You give you the ability to turn a plug on and off over over the internet. Yep, plug what's, on, plug on and off via Wi-Fi. So you can like turn off your Christmas tree when you're out of the house. Is that the idea? You could turn your Christmas tree off and not have to crawl under the damn thing. Like that's what we use it for at home. 
Oh, oh. Okay. you can you can you can set up routines to have them go on and off at their own accord. Yep. They, and or let's say you happen to have your Christmas lights outside that utilize about I don't know five six Wemos, and boy, I went blurry. Um, the uh, and, and you could have that go on at the same time. Yep. I mean, you know, Yo, as an example. Nice list. Yep. As as an example, uh, I have a bunch of stuff in my office um, <laughs> that is. Yeah, and, and they uh, they're uh, um, Amazon Echo compatible, so um, mm -hmm. you connect your Wemo app to your uh, your Echo. Uh, you can now have these these plugs uh, available. Um, I have four of them in my office, um, and my office is twelve by twelve. So there's four of them in my office. There are two that turn on and off lava lamps. There's mm -hmm. another one that turns off on and off a little lamp uh, above my desk. And the other one turns on and off like a four inch black and white television behind me that plays movies on a loop, like little black and white powered battery powered TV. So just stuff um, that's easy for me to say, Alexa, TV on or, you know, Alexa, lava lamp one on type of thing. Uh, easier mm -hmm. for me to say that than to actually like have to stand up and reach and grab, grab the switch or that the little rotating switch on the lamp cord is buried behind my desk somewhere. You know, Larry, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Talking about all the devices and all the switches and a four-inch black and white TV with movies on it, has anybody ever diagnosed you with ADHD? <laughs> um, no. No, no, they have not. And it was a very interesting conversation that we had with my oldest child uh, because our youngest has been diagnosed. And the oldest child said, well, how did she get it? Isn't it hereditary? And I said... <laughs> and and then they proceeded to go read up on it, and uh, next day was dead. You know, I, I read a bunch of stuff, and like, you totally exhibit all of the symptoms. Like, like, dad, you're completer. I'm like, and like this yeah. com this comes out of the Disney pin thing. Like, there's a series of pins of six pins, and dad, you've got to have all six. I'm like. Uh huh. Yes, you do. Yeah, ask, ask me about the Star Wars pins that I just picked up from uh, the the Tatooine stuff that goes on this nice board, nice canvas, and only two of them are available in Euro Disney parks. Mm -hmm. And how many threads have you gotten where you're asking people to buy them and ship them to you? I uh, know they were available on eBay for uh, highly inflated prices. <laughs> Got it. You know, Got it. you know, Dad, Complete. that apple didn't fall far from the tree. Nope, nope. Like, Dad, like, how many knives do you have? Uh, All of them. Um, Next. Uh, how many watches do you have? Uh, I have one watch to go with every knife. How's that? <laughs> 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 yeah. Yep. Exactly. How many gadgets do you have? All of them. Next. Yeah, yeah, no, not all of them, Josh. I bought two of them. Because you never know, one might need to transmit and one might need to receive. This is true. And then, and then, when I bought them, where the hell did I put them? So I have to buy another one. I literally had this happen this week. I bought an Evil Crow RF right when they first came out. Do you think okay. I can find it? Do you think I can find it? No. No, no, no. So I was talking with... Uh, someone said, dude, have you checked out the Evil Crow RF? I'm like, yeah, I got one of those around here somewhere. I only checked it out a little bit. I'm like, oh, well, yeah, the link's here. And I'm like, so I went and bought another one. Just can't find the other one. <laughs> that was a month ago. Do you think I can find that Evil Crow off I just bought a month ago? So you need to buy another no. one. I can't find it. I, I, I haven't bought another one yet. I'm still giving myself a little bit of time. It's literally a, a, since I've been back to the studio to come back for, for podcast. Like I usually throw a gadget in my bag to tinker with. And I've been mm -hmm. looking for that Evil Crow hack, uh, RF to throw in my bag to tinker with for the show since I've been back from surgery. And I haven't found it yet. It's almost time to buy a new one. All right. Oh. Anything else we want to hit before we uh, get out of here? Anybody else have a... Have I'm good. Something? You're good? Oh. You're good. I know we talked about um, uh, Geekin in the, the start of the show, so maybe we should. I mean, that's one of the failures. We, we talk about that stuff. Uh, I didn't get a chance to, to read a ton of this stuff um, about Geekin. 
but Geekin is now an open source project that uh, will uh, go implementation of the Cobalt Strike Beacon for working on uh, Mac OS. Mm. And it's potentially kind of terrifying in that um, the particular individual that released it on um, um, GitHub with uh, Geekin Plus and Geekin Pro uh, may or may not be Chinese actors of some variety. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Yeah, the unsigned Geekin payload is retrieved for an IP address in China. It, before it begins beaconing activity, the user is presented with a two-page decoy document embedded in the Geekin binary. Uh, uh, by the way, you know the Evil Crook 2 is out, right? Uh, yes. Hmm. Just checking. Just checking. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So... What do you think? Time to call tonight. Wrap. Evening, yeah. evening, a stream, a podcast. Yeah. What do you think, Aaron? Do you want to go to bed? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I I don't. I got lost in a total um, rabbit hole of Cobalt Strike there. And every time we talk about Cobalt Strike, my mind just goes all over the place. It's like, can we ever get rid of this? Would we want to get rid of this? Why is the sort of Microsoft and the organization that sort of um, made it they're like um yeah we'll stop it being used for bad stuff it's just like the whole kind of worms there cobalt strike it is we see in, but in a good way sometimes yeah there's it, it, you know it's one of those tools that's you know it's a it's two-way street right um you know it yeah. can be used well, this was the old argument about metasploit back in the day it can be used for good it can be used for evil um but uh mm -hmm. and and you know knowing uh, uh mudge Raphael mudge um, you know, had the best intentions for doing this right from the get-go and through their licensing, you know, there were folks that were vetted that got these licenses and hackers, hackers going to hack. And yeah. yeah, over time, the older versions got hacked serial numbers and so forth. And then they started being used as evil payload. The original intent was for it to be good. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Same like Metasploit and NMAP and all these types of things that you know, we've come over the years. Dual use munitions. It's the way it goes. <clears throat> yep. Can be used to uh, heat your vegetables and it can be used to blow up factories. Right. All right, gentlemen. With that, how about we Thank call you. tonight? Aaron, take us um, out of here, buddy. Thanks. Take us out of here, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for having me this this week. Um, uh, I'm on three shows this week, so um, it's great to be back within the Larry Security Weekly Fold. Long live Larry. 